Let's begin. We have a lot of cover to cover today. Uh, like I said, I want to finish regression in three lectures. Uh, some activities we will skip, and your colleague last time suggested uh, watching the lecture from last time. I put a link card on the YouTube video actually linking to the last year's lecture, so I'll do that. If we skip an activity that we did uh, past spring, uh, I'll, I'll, link, uh, I'll link to that so you can see it in the video. I will pick up from where we left off last time with error analysis, but I'll review it briefly, where we started talking about, so okay, we did this regression. We did regression to a straight line. We're gonna do fancier regression today and uh, next Tuesday. Uh, but we, before we go any further, we need to assess, we need a mechanism to evaluate the error we've committed in our regression. So in this case, we're treating the data that's given to us as the truth. There might be uncertainty in that data itself, and we will talk about that in statistics in the spring. But given this data, assuming that's the truth, the regression curve, the regression line we did, um, obviously doesn't hit each and every point. It kind of passes through in between the data. It captures the trend of the data. And it commits an error compared to those data. Uh, we need to assess that error. And this is what these few, this discussion uh, will do. Uh, we started by discussing standard deviation last time. And on average, some of uh, what those of you who have seen standard deviation or have learned it, um, have a rough idea of what it is. For those of you who haven't seen it, we discussed it last time and we said it's a measure of how much the data is spread with respect to the mean. Now that's very important when I say with respect to what. And because we're treating the mean as our gold standard for representing data. Why? Because it is the simplest statistic that you could do. If you are given data, the simplest thing you could do to represent the data is to model it as using the average. Okay? And so in that perspective, the standard deviation measures the spread of the data around the mean. It can also be thought as the average error committed when representing the entire data using just the mean value. Just a mind shift here, how to think about the standard deviation. Yes, it measures the spread of the data around the mean, but it's also effectively the error committed, the average error committed when you use the mean to represent the data. So think now of the mean as being a model for the data you're given. And we're going to use that to measure, to assess the error in regression. Okay. So we went through this exercise, and I get, asked you what is the best uh, statistic you could do for the data, and it's the, it's the mean value, essentially the sum of all of the data points divided by the number of data points. We call that Y bar. Y, again, is our response, our dependent quantity. X is our input independent quantity. In this case, we were looking at a person's height versus femur's length. Okay. And then we went on and said, Okay, so these data points lie a certain distance away from the mean value because we're using the mean to model the data. Next, we're going to use the regression curve to model the data. Okay, but I'm setting the stage for that. Okay, and that distance, the actual value of the data point minus the mean value, gives you a measure of the error committed at each one of those points if you use the mean to represent the data. If you use the mean to say all of these data, I'm just going to model them by a constant value, which is the mean value. Okay? And we measured that distance. We went through the, the math. And we said, OK, the sum of the square of those errors, the average error is divided not by n, but by n minus 1. And we will talk about the reason for the n minus 1 here has to do with what's called degrees of freedom in statistics. And we will explain that in the statistics course, um, hopefully. Uh, but it is, it is, if you divide by n, it will be okay, especially if you have a lot of data points. But in, in practice, you should divide by n minus 1, because you're looking at a sample of the population, so uh, you, you lose one degree of freedom there. That's how we, we say it in statistics. We will learn that in the spring. But that being said, then you can get the actual average distance as the sum of these errors, 
which is the y value from the input minus the mean value squared and divided by n minus 1 that gives you the average you need to take the square root to make this quantity in the same units as the distance okay because the square is the that distance squared so you need to take the square root to make this equal to make this in the units of the response variable and we call this quantity the standard deviation okay and this square root of this quantity is the standard deviation for any given uh, data set okay great so now when you plot the standard deviation again it's an average distance from the mean it's the average spread of the data around the mean or the average error committed when you use the mean to represent the data all of these statements are equivalent and typically you draw that with these dashed lines you see the mean value and the spread of the data in this case if you do the calculation so you get a standard deviation in this case of um, one uh, uh, what is the standard value here so of about 3.4 in this case sorry yeah so if you do the calculation for these data sets, that should have had a value for SY. We're going to do it in Python in a second. But typically what you say um, is you draw these lines and you say, okay, this is my average error if I were to use the mean value to represent all of these data. Okay? Now, we will also later learn in statistics um, about these things called normal distributions. They are very prevalent in nature and in life. That's the bell curve. If your data is distributed normally, what that means is most of the data is in the middle, some of it is on the left, some of it on the right, less and less so as you go away, you get a bell curve distribution of those data. So if you were to do a histogram of the heights of the people versus the femur, femur lengths, if you get a bell curve distribution, then you can know for sure that 68% of the data fall within a standard one standard deviation from the mean, okay, so most of the data is going to fall between these two dashed lines, and 95% will fall within two standard deviations from the mean. So that's, that's getting us into statistics. We will talk about this in statistics as well, but that's something that you probably heard of. Oh, yeah, 68% of the data falls within one standard deviation in a bell curve. Um, it's coming from this. And this very likely is a bell curve distribution. We notice in reality that most things related to like measurements related to humans and animals and stuff they all fall on a bell curve distribution so this is a very useful thing to recognize okay so what that means 68 percent like all of these data points they're going to be scattered and in between those two dashed lines and that's true even for this little sample here then more points are going to be within two standard deviations and then the rest are outside far away Okay, I have a little note here that in some cases you will see the value n used in the denominator for the standard deviation. Um, this is the difference between a sample standard deviation versus a population standard deviation. Um, with the sample standard deviation, because we had to use the y bar, we lost one degree of freedom, one knowledge point. Again, I will talk about this in statistics. So you have to unbias your, your data. Um, you do by n minus 1 rather than n. Most of the cases we are dealing with samples, not populations. So we have to use n minus 1 in the denominator. If you go into Python and say numpy.std, um, I don't know why they call it that. They should call it stdev, stdev, not <laughs> numpy, np.std. But you give it a bunch of data, it's going to divide by n. It's not going to divide by n minus 1. So be careful when you do that. There's an option in the numpy.std to say this is, should be n minus 1, but we're not going to use that. We're going to hard code this ourselves. OK, so looking at these two graphs, which one has a larger standard deviation? This is data scattered. The mean is in blue. Okay. So which one has a larger standard deviation? The, this one? Why? Data is spread farther away around the mean compared to this guy, OK? Good. Bravo. All right. Standard error. Now we're going to do the same thing, the same thought process, but for a regression curve. Okay? That's why I talked about the mean as a model of the data. Instead now of using the mean as a model for the data, I'm going to use the regression curve as the model for the data. 
So let's see how this works. Again, we're going to take the femur um, length and the person's height discussion. And this was our regression line, you know, x plus 123.4 or something. Right? So you draw that line. And this was our model. We had I, A1x plus A0. And the regression line, just like the mean, okay, divides the data, not in the middle, but there's data above it and there's data below it. Agreed? Some of the data even might lie on it. Could be any curve, right? But there's data above it and there's data below it. We call this the spread of the data around the regression curve. You could use the regression line, but if you actually had a curve, just say the spread of the data around the regression curve. Just like we said, the spread of the data around the mean. Okay? Similarly, each data point, yi, so each one of those points, falls a distance, yi minus that regression curve, away from the regression curve, right? So it's those distances. So if you were to take that data point and then evaluate the curve, the regression curve at that x value, you're going to get the point on the blue line, right? And that distance um, is what we're characterizing here, OK? Now, this, by the same token we did with the mean, this is actually the error. That's actually how we started to derive the regression curve. The distance from the regression curve to the actual data point defines an error between our model and the truth, the actual data point. All right? OK? So the aggregate distance of all of those squared, so if you sum all of these distances, that's going to give us the same definition we did in the beginning when we started deriving the regression date, the regression um, equations, the normal equations, the summation of the error squares, right? So now we're redoing this, but we're going to use it for a different purpose. So if you take the sum of all of those, yi minus fi, remember now, this is going to be a model, not the mean value. This is not y bar, like we did a few slides ago. This is going to be the model evaluated at point i. The square of that and its sum defines the total sum of the squares of the errors. Okay? That's what we did also when we derived regression. And this is analogous to what we did for the mean value. Okay? So now we can compute an average distance from the regression line. Just like you did, you compute an average distance from the mean value, you can compute an average distance from the regression line. So go ahead and do that. You have those distances squared. So now I want you to compute an average distance. You have n data points. Assume you have n data points. Just average that total error. Huh? But then what are we dividing by? So when we had the mean value, we divided this by n to take the average. But then I told you it's actually n minus 1 because we already used the mean value. Yeah? So it's going to be similar here. And don't forget to take the square root because we need it in the same units as the distance, OK? And you can use the word SR. So SRR stands for regression. I don't know why, where they came for with the S. Maybe it's just sum. You don't need absolute value because it's squared, right? Yeah, so you don't need absolute value, fi minus yi, yi minus fi, doesn't matter. Okay, so what's the average? It's sr over, oh, we have n data points. So that's the sum of distances squared from the line, OK? What's the average distance? I have n distances. The average is divided, yeah? So over, so it would be SR over n minus 1? Yeah. Square root, under the square root, right? OK. OK, who else? I mean, I would imagine it's just the average is dividing by the number of points, right? So it would be SR over n. Agreed? Yeah. 
and under the square root. Okay? So that's, that's a good start. But it's not going to be n. The same for... n minus 1. It's not n minus 1. But you're getting close. So why is it n minus 1? And again, this is a little vague. When we were dealing with the mean, we already used the data to compute the mean value, y bar. So we lost one piece of information. That's why we go n minus 1. And the fact is that you can get the last data point using the mean and n minus 1 data points. You can always get the last data point. So you lose one degree of freedom. Over here, our model for the straight line, we had two parameters, a0 and a1. And we already used the data to get those two parameters. So how many degrees of freedom did we lose? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be victory. Yes. So it's actually going to be over n minus 2. That's mind-blowing. Okay? So it's the same way. Same, and by the same token, we did this for the mean value. We're now measuring the average distance of the data around the regression curve. And here we're thinking that the regression curve is the model of our data. So then that average error, and now look at the, how the symbol is changing, S, Y given X. And again, don't ask me why they came up with this nomenclature. It has to do with statistics. We'll just use it and adopt it here. Now this is this distance, average over, we divide by N minus two, because we, have two, we lost two degrees of freedom because we already used the data to compute two parameters, a0 and a1. And then you take the square root of that to make it in the same units as the response variable. Okay? So this is the square of the, this is in units of the square of the response variable. So you have y squared. You take the square root to make it same units as y. Okay? And that would define another quantity that we call the standard error. Okay? The standard error. And the standard error, also just like we did with the dashed lines on the mean value, it's a constant. This standard error is going to be a single value. So there's data that falls within plus one standard error and minus one standard error from the regression curve. Again, we're analyzing this same analogy we did with the mean value, but you're doing the same analysis now with the regression curve. For normal distributions, also, 68% of the data fall within one standard error of the model fit, and 95% fall within two standard errors of the model. Okay? Okay. Now, standard error represents the average distance, like you said, of the observed value from the regression line. It tells us, actually, how wrong the regression model is on average with respect to the response variable. What I like to think about it as is the standard deviation was done with respect to the mean value, if you use the mean value as the model of your data. The standard error is the same thing. It's like a standard deviation, but with respect to the regression curve. So the standard error is for the regression curve what standard deviation is for the mean value. You're just measuring the spread with respect to something else, not the mean value. Okay? If you measure the spread with respect to the mean value, you, you call it standard deviation. If you, res if you measure the spread with respect to the regression curve that's trying to represent your data, you call that the standard error. Okay? The concept is the same, right? How much is the data spread around the mean? And how much is it spread around the regression curve? OK. So this is this statement here. Um, what's also very important here to recognize is that, again, I'm kind of jumping ahead for, of myself, but just I want to make this note. So if you had one value for standard deviation using the mean to represent the and then you do a regression. If the standard error now is smaller than the standard deviation, would you have done better than using the mean to represent the data? So if you use the mean to represent the data and you got some standard deviation, then you say, okay, I'm going to regress the data. You do a regression. 
And then you do the standard error, which is like the standard deviation, but with respect to the, to the regression line. And that standard error is much smaller than the standard deviation. Then is the regression doing better to represent the data or not? Yes, because there's less spread of data around the regression curve, because the standard error is smaller than the standard deviation. Okay, we'll get, we're gonna come back to this in a second. In general, for a regression model that has m parameters, so let's say you have a cubic, a1, a2, and a0, so you have three parameters, or a model with five coefficients, five parameters, your standard error needs to take that into consideration in the denominator. So with the standard deviation where we had the mean value only one parameter, we had n minus one. When we did regression to a straight line, it had two parameters, we had n minus two. If you have five parameters, this would be n minus five. We had six parameters, it would be n minus six. You have to take into consideration how many parameters are in your regression curve. We could be regressing to a model with four parameters. To compute the standard error, you need to take that into consideration. Okay, so you don't bias your analysis incorrectly. Okay? So now here's how this looks like. With respect to the mean, the standard deviation with respect to the mean was 3.16 centimeters. So that's the error we would have committed on average if we use the mean value to represent people's heights with respect to um, femur length, okay? So in other words, if I were to say, all people are, all people, everyone, are 167.8 centimeters regardless of their femur length, on average, I'm committing an error of 3.16 centimeters in people's heights, okay? I'm committing that kind of error. Now, when we did the standard, when we did the regression to the, strain, to the straight line, our standard error is 1.43 centimeters. So then if I'm using the regression line to model the height of people based on femur length, on average, I'm committing an error of 1.43 centimeters. Now, this goes back to my previous point, that in this case, we've reduced our error by half from 3.16 to 1.43, from, oh, by going from the mean value to a straight line regression. That's how you should think about it. That's how you should think about it. Always go back to the mean. Are we doing better than using the mean value in our regression analysis? And is it worth it? In some cases, you'll see it's not worth it at all. Okay, so let's build on that. Okay. So here I had this activity, like what can you say about the regression model by looking at the values of the standard deviation, standard error? So the data is spread less around the regression line because the regression line has captured the trend of the data much better. So if you think of the mean as a model to represent the data, the regression model improved over that significantly. Yes? What do you mean? You have like just... If it wasn't relative to like your height? No, so that is simpler, simpler kinds of statistics. We don't, use, we don't use standard error or that. Or if you're just having a collection of femur length, you use different kinds of statistics to represent those data. You say, my sample has... On a, because there's no response in that case. You only have just yeah. one, one, like just independent data. And the statistics you describe on that would be just mean, standard deviation, and that's it. There's no, nothing to model there. because There's no response, yeah. right? So that's a simpler kind of statistic um, that you would think, think about. You say, yeah, aver our average female, femur length from the population or the sample is this and that. That's it, yeah. Yeah, but there's no response. There's no even concept of standard error then, right? Because you're not, there's no response to model, right? There's no Y versus X, okay? So this is higher order statistics, okay? So, okay, we go back to this point that we actually cut the error in half by using regression. That's really good. Okay, so let's drive now this point all the way to a nice conclusion. The standard deviation and standard error can be combined to tell us how good a data fit is. So again, we're after making a measure 
of how well our regression curve did to represent the data, right? We want to assess the error. So we went through all of these hoops, standard deviation, standard error, and these summations, et cetera, to get to this point. Okay, so for using the mean to represent the data, we had this S sub Y summation of YI minus Y bar squared, et cetera. And from that, remember that ST was the sum of the error squared with respect to the, to the mean value, okay? So that's the magnitude of the error prior to regression, but with respect to the mean. So think of it this way, this ST is the magnitude of the total error, okay? Prior to regression, but with respect to the mean. Then when we did regression, we had this formula for the standard error, and this summation here was, we called it SR, it was the magnitude of the error after regression, but with respect to the regression line, okay? With respect to the So we have two errors here, two errors, SR and S of T. ST is the error with res in the data with respect to the mean. Again, the way to phrase that is if you were to use the mean to represent all the data, then the error committed is ST. If you were to use regression to represent the data, the error committed is SR. Okay, good. Now, the difference or the comparison between those two errors means something. What is it? And I kind of just discussed it with you. Okay, so if you were to use it, you get an error. You go do regression, you get another error. You compare the two. One is larger, one is smaller. Think about it. Okay? So ST is the error committed by using the mean to represent the data. SR is the error committed by using regression to represent the data. There's really only two cases. If SR and ST are equal, you go from using the mean to the regression and you, the error is the same. The error is the same. Okay, let me just finish this point and I'll get back to you. And another case, the only other case, is when the error after regression is much smaller than the error before regression. Lucas. The closer they are together to each other, the, the better so better for what compared to what? Like, what does it mean? Okay. So the regression would be good or bad? Uh huh. Uh -huh. So doing regression would have made much of a difference. Okay. So your colleague is saying, if for the first case, if SR and ST, or the error before regression and the error after regression is the same then regression wouldn't have made a difference. Do you agree? Duh, yeah, of course. Then why do regression in the first place? Just use the mean value to represent the data. You're better off, it's easier, it's simpler. Okay, what about the other case? SR is the error after regression. If the error after regression is much smaller than the error before regression, what does that mean? Yeah, so the regression did a pretty darn good job. Regression allowed us to reduce the error in representing the data. So regression did a great job in that case. Okay? Okay. So the difference really quantifies the improvement that regression has made over just using the mean value to represent the data. I challenge anyone to explain the standard error, the, the R squared value, whatever we're talking about, to explain it better than this approach. Best way to think about this in my opinion, and in truth, <laughs> is to use the, think of the mean as a model of the data, and then compare regression to using the mean as the model. Okay, think of it this way. What am I doing after regression? Am I reducing the spread? Am I reducing that error in representing the data? And then you can combine those two together, okay? You can combine them together to define what's called the R squared value. So, Obviously, those values, it's important to take their difference, but we need to normalize them because the, their difference could be 1,000 or 500 or 10. So you need to normalize them to get a value between 0 and 1. We call that the R squared value. So we take the error before regression minus error after regression over error before regression, and that normalizes everything between 0 and 1, and we call that the R squared value. Okay, so see what happens. 
when ST and SR, when the error before regression and after regression are the same or close to each other, then R squared will be a very small value. It will be a very, very small value, almost zero. So bad regression. So if you remember your trend line in Excel and you had the R squared value close to zero, you say bad regression. So that's, that's why this is the case. Now, if SR is much smaller than ST, means we reduce the error after regression, then this would be approximately one because this is vanishingly small. You get ST over ST almost one. So as R squared approaches one, you get the best, almost unbelievable doctored data, you know, when, when your R squared value is nearly one, okay? And you can do the math around this. You get R squared equal one minus SR over ST. So if SR is much smaller than ST, then R squared is almost one. And if SR is about the same as ST, you get close to zero, okay? So remember that in your mind. So R squared approaches zero is a bad fit, no improvement. And R squared approaches one is a perfect fit, significant improvement over just using the mean to describe the data. Okay, here's some data, y versus x, okay? Given this data, answer these three questions without doing any calculation, just visually looking at this. Draw a regression line, straight line. Just, you know, your best bet of where the regression line is gonna be. Compare SR and ST, so tell me which one is smaller, which one is larger and estimate the, the R squared value without doing any calculations. Go. So think of ST, ST is the standard deviation or the error, related to standard deviation, the error before regression, SR is the error after regression. All you need to know if, if they're close or one is smaller than the other. But draw the regression line first. Okay, any answers? Ashton, start question one. Uh -huh. So that black line, almost that black line, okay. Question two, that's correct. So regression line is just gonna be on top of the average value. Question two, do you think error before regression, uh -huh. SR? Okay, why? Uh-huh, okay. So the error before regression is just about the same as the error after regression. So what does that, that tell us about the R squared value? It's zero. It's zero. Good job. Okay. Here's the actual calculation. If I were to do regression on this, I will get this regression curve. Okay. And it's actually almost 0.003x plus 0.058 for the intercept. And the R squared value is 0 0.0005, it's really bad, okay? So I might as well use the mean value to represent this data, okay? Okay, what about this? Do the same thing? Okay? Okay, let's start with question one. Zach, you're looking at me. <laughs> so um, it's going to be a diagonal line going up. Okay. Pretty close to the uh, percentage of Okay, I agree. 
So Zach is saying the line, the regression line, is going to be right on those blue, uh, yellow data points. And it's going to be like right in between them, very close to them. So question two is, what do you think the error before and after regression is going to be, comparatively? much smaller. The regression error, just visually looking at this, the line is going through those yellow points really, really nicely. So the, the spread of the yellow points around the regression line is much smaller. They're more tightly close to the regression line than they are to the mean value. So what does that tell us about the R-squared value? <coughs> I know you know the answer. Let's see if someone else could think about it. It's going to be pretty darn close to one. Okay. You might say that I doctored this data so to make the case here. So indeed, the regression line is almost just x. It okay, cuts this diagonally exactly. So it's 0.99x plus 0.07. And the r squared value is 0.99. So 99%, 99.6% uh, because and it's just doing a much better job to represent the data than if you were to, me to use the mean value. Okay? So change your perception about how you think about, if you've, le if you've seen this before, this will change your perspective, how you think about the mean and the regression data. If you haven't seen it, I'm glad you learned it here. This is how you should think about it. Okay. Now we will close this loop by going back to our um, Jupyter Notebook, where we did the regression for the person's height versus femur's length. We need to compute um, standard deviation, standard error, and compute the R-squared value. Unfortunately, there's no direct facility in Python that does that for us with NumPy or SciPy. There's some in some advanced statistical libraries, but those are such a, it's like taking a, a, a bulldozer or a excavator to hammer a nail. So we're just going to program those nicely ourselves. Um, it will take a little bit of effort, but it's not significant. So let's go ahead and do just that. Grab your notebooks. We worked that the notebooks we worked with last time. Okay. Window. And I know you might not remember all the coding activities, um, but hopefully with a nice review later you can remember what we've done here. And we're working with this, then we used, we used our regression, then we used polyfit. And polyfit was so cool because we were able to use polyval. Okay. And then I asked you to do this at home if you were to do uh, the regression manually yourself, so I'm going to skip this. I'm assuming you you did this at home. You're going to do this at home. So we're going to jump to this point over here. So starting with the standard deviation for the data, we're trying to do this calculation, summation of yi minus y bar squared over n minus 1. And y bar is the summation of the data, just the average um, value. So sum of yi over n. And so we would need y bar first, and then take the difference, and then divide, take the square root. OK, so let's start with y bar. Let's go ahead and start with y bar. And that's going to be, um, if you remember, maybe not in the slides. So y bar is going to be the sum of yi over n. And if you recall, I mentioned briefly, you can use numpy.sum over your entire data set and divide by n. Now, we don't have n, except we do n is length of yi. Okay, so let me just do this. Okay, so the mean value, say print mean value is equal to y bar. Okay, so 167.8. What are the units here? Centimeter, okay? So 167 centimeters, right? So, okay. okay. So that gives us y bar. Now we can compute st, which is sum of yi minus y bar squared. Again, I'm going to do mp.sum, and I will do yi minus y bar and squared. Square all of that. 
squared. Now remember, because it's an array operation, it's going yi is an array of, y va of values. From each value, it's going to subtract y bar and square it. And then mp.sum is going to sum them all up. So this will, the result of this is a single number. It's a scalar value, one number. And then sy is the square root of this thing, p dot square root of st over n minus 1. Okay? And that gives us our standard deviation for this set, which is 3.5 centimeters. Okay? So that's the error committed in people's height if you were to use the mean value to represent people's height as a function of femur length. This numpy.sum is incredibly useful for these things. Right, we good? If you're good, go ahead to the next step. Are we all synchronized? Anyone still working on this? Okay. Standard error. The standard error is given by this sy given x, whatever is this, square root of sr over n minus 2. So we'll do it the same way, um, except for sr, we have sum of yi minus fi squared. F, uh, what is fi? What is fi? f is our model. Agreed? It was what we called f of x was a0 plus a1x. So how do we get fi over here? We just need to evaluate the model at each xi value. Remember, fi is f of xi. Is the model evaluated at each xi value? Okay? So how do we do this? Let me see. Okay. So we could very simply say fi is polyval. Remember, we had the coefs at, at xi. We did this last time when we plotted these guys here. Remember, polyval, coefs at xi. That's our model at xi at the input values. That's effectively fi. So when you look at this plot, fi is the values at the blue line that correspond to the values on the x-axis with the red points. Okay? This would be fi, fi over here, fi, and so on. So that's what's cool about polyval. It just does that for you automatically. So fi is polyval. Co we're using the coefs from the regression polyfit at all the xi values. Finally, we can do sr and p dot sum. I'm going to open outer parentheses. Then I will have yi minus fi squared. Okay? And then syx is mp dot square root of sr over n minus 2. And you print this, you get 1.43 centimeters. So if we were to use the regression curve to represent a person's height versus their femur length, on average, we will be committing an error in their height of about plus or minus 1.43 centimeters. And that was consistent with what I measured. I, I'm like 168, and I think I, I got 160. Seven for the uh, for for my height, right? So that falls within um, this standard error. Okay, that's a reasonable estimate. Okay, finally we get to do the r squared value, which is one minus st sr over st, right? So we already had y bar done. Sorry, so we don't need y bar over here. Um, uh, we can do r squared much cleaner. Hold on. So we do r squared as 1 minus sr over st. Agreed? Gives us an 85% r squared value. Okay? 0 0.85. So it's, 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 it's a good value. It's, it's uh, realistic. When you see r squared values, close to 1, um, you should be very suspicious and skeptical of the data. Um, it's not realistic to get such high R-squared values in, in, in reality. 
Um, some of the best values might be 80%, 0.85 80, like this. So tells you you're doing a pretty darn good job with regression. Okay? Now it could be your regression model is really bad. Like maybe the data is parabolic and you're representing it with a straight line and you get a 0.1 R squared value, then your model is wrong. Do a better model for the data, right? Okay. We good? Okay. We move on. Okay. Let's make it harder. I only make it harder because you're up to the challenge, okay? All right. You can tell me, what if we don't want to be up to the challenge? I think you're up to the challenge. So, Okay. We want to generalize now. So we talked about regression to a straight line. We derived it. We did polyfit. All good. So think about what you've learned in just this week, where you started and where you're at right now. We studied how linear regression works. We learned what it means, standard deviation, standard error, thinking about the mean as a representation of the data, modeling the data. Uh, polyfit, polyval, and p.sum, all of those tools and things that are just coming at you. We want to generalize now because obviously regression to a straight line is not the only regression you could do. There's oftentimes data doesn't belong to a straight line okay, and it can be represented better than a straight line. So we want to generalize. Um, but first, I want to clarify what I mean by linear regression. And this is the this is the most um, accurate representation, I say it for the nth time, that in this class, when I say linear interpolation or linear regression, I do not refer regression to a straight line or interpolation to a straight line. What I mean by linear interpolation or linear regression specifically is that the least square system of equations that governs the coefficients of the model is linear. In other words, the coefficients of the model show up linearly in the model itself or in the, or in the normal equations. So in that sense, we go back to interpolation, cubic polynomial interpolation, all resulted in linear systems of equations. Those were all linear type interpolants, although the model itself is highly nonlinear. Okay? So in that sense, polynomial regression and other models, when the coefficients show up linearly, are going, we're going to call them all linear regression, okay? What is best to do is just to say and be clear about it. Say, I'm doing regression to a straight line, regression to a quadratic, regression to a cubic, and just ditch that confusion about linear, whatever, linear, nonlinear regression, okay? Can be confusing, just be clear. Say, we did regression to a polynomial. Nobody's going to argue with that. They understand what a polynomial is. Or we did regression to an exponential model. Here's what it looks like. Yeah. So let's start with a couple of examples. What if we wanted to use this model? A0 plus A1x plus A2x squared. Yeah. What do you think we're going to get for the system of equations, for the normal equations? Are they going to be linear or nonlinear? Okay, let's see. So if you were to do... The same machinery, we, compute, we define S, the sum of the squares of the adder, and then expand it. We plug in the model formula. We plug in Fi over here, and we expand it, just like last time. Then this summation is minimum. We remember we're minimizing the sum of the squares of the errors, is if these conditions are met, or if the slope of S with respect to A0, A1, and A2 at the same time is equal to 0. So when you do this, you do the derivatives, you get a system of equations for A0, A1, and A2. How do they show up? They show up linearly. So yes, this model is going to result in a linear system of equations for the coefficient. Although the model itself is a quadratic, it's highly nonlinear, the system of equations that governs the parameters, A1, A0, and A2, is linear. I'm going to call that linear part of linear regression analysis. Okay, three equations, three unknowns, you can solve it. Good, all right? Okay, what about this? A plus BX cubed. Do you think it's going to be result in a linear system of equations for A and B or nonlinear? Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, because they show up linearly. Yep, yep. So by now you should get the trend that same as with interpolation, when the coefficients show up linearly, you are guaranteed to get a linear system of equations for the normal equations here. Okay. So this was an activity you can do it at home. Okay. You define. You have. So by the way, you need to be very versatile doing this. S, writing S down, expanding it, and doing these derivatives. Okay. So these are all examples that you can use at home and rehearse. Okay. So you get this system of equations for this model. Okay. Okay. So what about this? What if my data looked like this? I have the blue data points, and this is an actual regression that I did, and the dashed curve is my regression model. The data is sinusoidal in this case, and my model is going to be A cosine T plus B sine T. T is the independent variable, and the Y value is my response variable. So something as a function of time of day. Do you think we're going to get a linear system of equa linear normal equations or not? Why? Because the coefficients a and b show up linearly. Okay, this is going to be a theme. Like I've, I'm, these are, I have like five examples here, all the same. This is going to be a theme. But just eyeballing this, a and b showing up linearly, will immediately imply that the normal equations are linear. You're not convinced of that? Go be my guest. Derive the governing, the, derive the equations yourself. This is a little bit more tedious. No, not necessarily. You just have sines and cosines. You got to keep track of them. And then, indeed, you get a system of equations for A and B that is linear. Okay? I, I'm, I'm going through this. I would spend more time with you doing these derivations, but we wouldn't finish. Okay? But like I said last time, I'm going to compress this a little bit, and I'm hoping you can work these examples out at home. If you tell me you want examples for doing these equations, you have seven examples here. These are your examples. Okay? It's the same thing over and over again. Okay? Now what if you wanted to do this model? A cosine t plus b sine t plus c e to the minus t squared. Same thing. Coefficients show up linearly. They're not inside the exponentials or the cosines or the logarithms. Okay? They're going to result in, a nor in normal equations that are linear. Okay? And this is indeed the system of equations. You should be able to go from there to here. Okay, this will be on the exam. I will ask you. I will have three, four problems like this. Here's a model. Derive S. Derive the system of equations. Okay? Just do S, do the derivatives, and then build the, co the system of equations. Okay. But you can imagine, like this is a tedious process. If every time you're going to write S and you have to take its derivatives, it's an incredibly tedious process, OK? Those who took it in the spring with me were really complaining by this point because we had to do all of these derivatives together. It's a tedious process. It's prone to errors. Unfortunately, you will have to do it maybe this one time in your life you know, for this course. But then I'll teach you a method where you don't have to do derivatives anymore. Like Everybody will be happy with that. OK. <laughs> all right. So now the. System of equations for regression with arbitrary functions can be tremendously cumbersome to derive. Okay? So all of these will require you to write S and then do derivatives and then deduce this system of equations. But there's a much easier way to get to this system of equations without doing a single derivative, just look by looking at that model. And it's kind of you can eyeball it, right? So in the first row, you have the first basis function cosine t multiplied by the same basis function, and then cosine t times sine t, and then cosine times exponential. On the second line, you take the second basis function and multiply it by all the other basis functions. The last one, you take the last basis function and multiply it by all the other ones, put the summation, and you build the system. So we're going to build on that. There's truth in that observation, actually. Okay? There's an easier way to do it, but first we need to do the basis functions, which we did in interpolation. <laughs> So I don't have to do basis functions again here. But remember what basis functions were. They were these elementary functions that we combined together in a linear manner. You can combine them non-linearly. But here, we're just focused on combining them linearly okay, with these parameters in red to make a co more complicated model. Okay? And I gave this example for basis functions. We did that in interpolation. We're good to go. 
Okay, so for now, to illustrate the method I'm going to teach you now, um, for now, let's consider one example model only with two basis functions, because it's easier to reason about this with two basis functions and with two parameters A and B. My first basis function is phi, so this could be cosine, sine, log, square root, whatever. My second basis function called psi, again, could be log, exponential, whatever you want. Okay, just dummy basis functions. Now, the system of equations for least squares regression for this model is going to look like this. So if I were to write S equals summation of yi minus fi squared, and fi is a phi of xi plus or phi i plus b of ci, do the substitution, do the derivatives, do the whole process, set them equal to zero, you will get this. Two equations, two unknowns as expected, good. Okay, but here's the observation that I'm going to make. You will notice that in the first row, I'm taking the first basis function and multiplying it by all the other basis functions. So in the first entry, it's phi i times phi i. Second entry is phi i times c i. In the second row, I'm taking the second basis function and multiplying it by all the others. So c i times phi i, c i times c i. Okay, this is how we're going to do this. So we're going to rewrite this as follows. Turns out that if I were to take my basis functions and put the first basis function on this first row, second basis function on the second row, and write out the entire values of the basis evaluated at x1 and x2 and x3. So you get phi1, phi2, phi3, and so on. C1, C2, all the way to Cn. Remember, C1 is C at x1. C2 is C at x2. Phi1 is phi at x1. So it's the value of the basis function at the input x value. Okay? And you will notice that that column vector over there is nothing more than the product of this matrix by this vector. And you can do this. You can take the first row multiplied by the first column here, and you get phi1, y1, plus phi2, y2, plus phi, et cetera, phi n, y n, which is the first entry there. And the second one is indeed c1, phi1, plus c2, phi2, all the way to c n, phi n, is the second entry, right? So you can agree with this. This is a 2 by n matrix. Okay, times a, two, a, times a 1 by n, a times an n by 1, so you get a 2 by 1 vector. Okay, so this is consistent. Yeah. And this one here is also this matrix here, phi, phi, multiplied by its transpose. So this is 2 by n times n by 2 is going to give you a 2 by 2 matrix, which is indeed 2 by 2. Check the entries. The first entry is sum of phi i, phi i, which is phi 1, phi 1, plus phi 2, phi 2, plus phi 3, phi 3, and so on. Indeed, it's phi 1, phi 1, plus phi 2, phi 2, plus phi 3, phi, plus phi n, phi n. Okay, so the first row times the first column. Second entry is the first row times the second column. It's phi 1, psi 1, phi 2, psi 2, phi 3, phi n, psi n, right? Same thing for the lower left entry. It's this row times this first column, so you get that, and you get the last one. You can verify this for yourself. This is, this is true, it's a fact, it's not an opinion. Okay. Now, what's really unique about this is that this matrix, or its transpose, whatever, however you want to produce it, it's a very special matrix, it has a special meaning. In the first column, I have all of the basis function, uh, the first basis function, in the second column, I have the second basis function, right? So we had phi and psi. Remember, we're, to we're playing around with this toy example. Because I want to generalize this, so you do regression without having to do the derivatives and all of that. Okay? But then, the rows, is you evaluate at the first observation, at the second observation, and at the nth observation. So, if you're given phi and psi, which you are given phi and psi in general, right? Because that's your regression model and you're given the xi values, you can build this matrix very easily. In the first column, you put the first basis function evaluated at all the input values. The second column, you put the second basis function evaluated at all the input values. Then, you can use this matrix to build the regressions, to, to build the normal equations. We're gonna call this A, we're gonna call this Y, and this is A transpose, okay? And the unknowns, we call them alpha. And all you need to know, in general, 
is only the coefficient matrix A, which is deduced only from knowing the basis functions. There's not a single derivative. This system of equations is the same as the one we obtained. So you see the, the, the process we went with. If you knew A and, and multiply it by A transpose, you will get the system of equations that we derived by minimizing the sum of the errors. But you didn't do a single derivative. All you did was take the basis functions and evaluate them at the input values, put them in this matrix A. It's if you know A, you know it's transpose, you know why, and then you can solve the system of equations. This is a special form. This is only true for linear regression models. Okay? We can't use this for nonlinear. But this is a way that is an alternative to doing the derivatives and all of that. And this is valid for any and arbitrary linear regression model where the coefficients show up linearly. Okay? So in general, if you have m basis functions, 17 basis functions, 5 basis functions, 3 basis functions, all you have to know is the matrix A. The matrix A in its first column is the first basis function, second basis function, mth basis function. So you have, write down your basis functions, 1, x, x squared, then build this matrix, put 1s, x, x squared, and then give them an index, x1, x2, x3, because the rows are first observation, second observation, and so on. Once you know this, you can do your regression analysis. Now why do I need this? Because polyfit can only do regression to a full polynomial. It won't do it for a cosine t plus b log t. It doesn't do it. It doesn't even do it for a0 plus a1x cubed. It can't do it. It has to be a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus a3x cubed. So polyfit cannot do that. You have to do it manually. Okay? And to do it manually, this is the cleanest way to do it. You just know the matrix A just by looking by inspection. This is incredibly powerful. You don't have to write S. You don't have to, to do derivatives. I mean, remember last time we were doing the derivatives for the regression to straight line, and that was a struggle. Right? This, you don't need to worry about that at all. Here's how you use it. You're given n data points in the form x1, y1, x2, y2, etc., and a linear regression model of the form a1, phi1, a2, phi2, and whatnot. Okay? Write down your basis functions, and then first write down the basis functions, which would be put them in braces, phi, sine, cosine, x, whatever, and then build your regression matrix. Okay? Column number corresponds to which basis function goes first. It doesn't matter the order. Order them however you like. It doesn't matter. It's going to be, once you multiply by the A transpose, it will correct everything. And then the row number corresponds to which observation the basis function is for. Build the Y vector, which only contains the observed values. And then just solve this system of equations. So you will, you will do A transpose times A. That gives you the final coefficient matrix for numpy.linalgebra.solve. And you solve it. Give it the right-hand side, and you're done. Okay, here's an example. Okay, here's an example. So consider the model A plus BX. So that's the one we started with. At the beginning, we derived this. We spent almost an hour trying to derive that. You can do it in like one minute here. Okay? So given this model, use this methodology to write down the regression matrix. So we're going to call A the regression matrix from now on. Um, and show that the resulting system is indeed this one. So we'll do this together. My model is a plus bx. I'm going to write down my basis functions. They're going to be 1 and x. My regression matrix contains in the first column, contains the first basis function. And in the second column, contains the second basis function. So it's going to be 1, x. Now the rows are going to be x1, x2, x3, all the way to xn. That's my regression matrix. First basis function, second basis function. Copy it all the way down with the observations. Assume you have n observations always. So first basis function, second basis function. First observation, second observation, nth observation. My solution vector is a and b. So I'll call that alpha. And my y vector is the given data points, y1, y2, and all the way to yn. Okay. Now build a transpose a. So if this is a, this is its transpose. You just rotate the first column, rotate the second column, so you get ones and x's over here. Now this gives you 
If you do the product, this gives you exactly the system we obtained last lecture. If you remember, we had n, which is 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1 all the way to the end, so it gives you n. And then 1 times x1 plus 1 times x2 and so on gives you some xi. Same here, here. x1 times 1 plus x2 times 2 gives you this. And then some x squared. That was what we derived by hand last time. A transpose y is the right-hand side. Again, you multiply the, that um, transpose of the matrix by the y vector, and you get that system of equations, which we did um, tediously by hand. OK. This is very beautiful. It's a, it's a nice shortcut. That's what I use when I'm coding up a unconventional linear regression model. That's what I use. I don't, do that, I don't waste my time with derivatives. I just go to the regression matrix. OK, so let's do this now. Um, a plus bx plus cx squared. Uh, I'll just do it with you. You should rehearse this at home. There's a ton of examples here. OK, so don't come and ask me for examples. I will tell you, go look at the slides. If there's still trouble, I'll give you more examples. OK? So same, same thing here. Identify the basis functions, which are 1, x, and x squared, because my model is a plus bx plus cx squared. And simply build the matrix A. It, in the first column, it contains the first basis function, which is 1. Second column, the second basis function. Third column, the third basis function. Right? Each row is an observation. Call them x1 to xn. Okay, so we have x1 to xn, x1 squared to xn squared. Once you have A, you're done. Once you have A, you're good to go. Then A transpose times A. You know how to do the transpose. So this first column becomes the first row. Second column becomes the second row. Third column becomes the third row. And then you do the, the matrix product. And then if you do this, okay, first observation. And then if you do this, you recover the system of equations for that quadratic. OK, let's now do a log x plus b cosine x. Okay? Again, your basis functions are log x and cosine x. So your a is going to be log x1, log x2, all the way to log xn, cosine x1, cosine x2, all the way to cosine xn. Okay? Columns are the basis functions. Rows are the observations. You bid A, you can get A transpose. You do the product between the two matrices, and you get this, which was, this was an example a few slides ago where you had to do the summation and differentiate by hand and everything. Okay? So this is pretty useful. And that's how I would do it when um, working in Python for things that don't work with polyfit. Again, polyfit will only work with a full polynomial, a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared, and so on. Anything that breaks that cannot work. In Python, you can very easily build this matrix using um, a function in NumPy called numpy.columnStack. And you can do, build this entire matrix in one line of code. You have to be a little bit um, careful doing this. And if you had, so with NumPy.ColumnStack, what it does, it takes a, an array, a 1D array, which is like this guy, and puts it in, in the first column. And then takes the second array, puts it in the second column, and so on. So if you have phi1, phi2, phi3, your basis functions, all you have to do is evaluate the basis function at the input points. So phi1 at xi, phi2 at xi, that's going to be an array, right? Because xi is an array, input array. Phi, the, the, um, the basis function at xi is also going to be an array, containing the basis function, evaluate x1, x2, x3, and so on. Okay? You put numpy.column stack, it generates this matrix instantly, and then you multiply by the transpose, and you're good to go. So here's a pseudocode for this. Given xi and y, yi data arrays, you do numpy.column stack, phi1 at xi, phi1 of x, uh, phi2 of xi, and so on. Now you have a, then a transpose a, you simply take a dot transpose multiplied by a. So remember, you have to take it from the left hand side. Same thing, a transpose times yi, you get the right hand side, and numpy.linalgebra.solve. Don't say you don't know how to do this. This is how you do it. Here are two examples. And we will do, we don't have time to do the coding activity. We'll do it next time. But here's an example for this model, for a plus bx. Okay? So my first basis function is 1. My second basis function is x. 
So I do numpy.column stack, and the first basis function is simply numpy.ones of size n, which is the number of data points. The second basis function is simply xi, right? x1, x2, and so on. Python takes these and puts these 1D arrays into that matrix, and then you have A, and then you multiply it by A transpose. For this guy, for example, same. The first column is, is ones, the second column is x, and the third column is xi squared. It's that simple to build A, okay? Um, we have a coding activity here. I don't think we have time to do it, but I'll kind of briefly explain it. So, um, three disease-carrying organisms decay exponentially in lake water according to the following model. Um, so, this is the, the, uh, the rate of decay, like how many organisms are left, or the population of the bacteria after a certain time in hours, okay? And the model is A, e to the minus 1.5t, plus B, e to the minus 0.3t, plus C, e to the minus 0.05t. Now, this is an expert model developed by some, someone who studies bacteria and lakes. Right? They know that model. You will know it in your career. Okay? I am going to give it to you right now. Okay? And they have these observations. 0 0.5, after half an hour, after half an hour, the population was 6 or 6 million organisms. Doesn't matter, it's normalized. After one hour, you had 4.4 organisms. After two hours, 3.2. After nine hours, we went down to 1.1 million or 1,000. Doesn't matter. Now, to do this, we, this obviously cannot be done with polyfit. It's not a polynomial, okay? But it's a linear model because A, B, and C, those coefficients, they show up linearly. We're trying to find A, B, and C. Don't forget that. We're trying to find the coefficients so that this model can represent the trend in these data, okay? So then all you have to do is list your basis functions, which are e to the minus 1.5t, e to the minus 0.3t, e to the minus 0.05t, and put them in the A matrix. That's the A matrix. Column 1, basis function 1. Column 2, basis function 2. Column 3, basis function 3. I have a typo here. This should be Tn, OK? And on the right-hand side is your values, P1, P2, the population after certain hours. OK? So this can be built with numpy.column stack, exponential minus 1.5t, exponential minus 0.3t, Etc. Ti is an array, so the exponential of this is also going to be an array. Python will nicely stack those in a matrix, and then you can solve the system. We'll do it on Tuesday. Okay, we'll do it on Tuesday. Please stay on top of the slides. We're going, I, I promise you, we're, we're going to go even faster in ODEs, okay? We're almost done. You're almost done with the fall semester, right? You need to pick things up faster. Next year is going to be insane, okay? So start doing it now. Make sure you review the slides before next Tuesday, okay? We're going to do nonlinear regression on Tuesday. Nonlinear regression. All right? Review the slides. Um, we'll see you on Tuesday. Have a good weekend. And Godspeed. Bye.